Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So today we will continue our discussion on uh, the introduction to tissue engineering. So we had looked at the two arms of the tissue engineering triad. We looked at what biomaterials uh, and uh, what are biomaterials and how they can be used. And we also looked at uh, cells and what are the different sources and types which we can which we can use. So today we will talk about uh, signaling molecules, uh, signals basically, not just signaling molecules. So we will first start with the signaling molecules, and I will also briefly introduce other signals. So uh, our focus here is just an introduction. So we will go into greater details in the later part of the semester. Okay. So uh, signaling molecules themselves can actually be grouped into three major categories, but they are actually overlapping categories. Some of the molecules will act as both as a mitogen and a growth factor or a morphogen and a growth factor and so on. So uh, these are mitogens, growth factors and morphogens. So classically it is defined as uh, mitogens are the ones which will st simulate cell division. Growth factors were initially identified to be the molecules that help in uh, cell proliferation and uh, it was later identified that it actually can have multiple functions. So the major challenge with respect to signaling molecules is how you deliver these molecules. Right? So uh, you need to have a controlled delivery with maybe spatiotemporal uh, release so that there can actually be a, a proper control signaling which will uh, aid in tissue regeneration. So usually this is delivered as a uh, using a biomaterial as the carrier and uh, the molecules can actually be chemically immobilized or physically encapsulated to provide some kind of a controlled release. Okay. So this is what is currently uh, being looked at. So what are growth factors? These are soluble secreted signaling polypeptides that are capable of instructing specific cellular responses in uh, biological lab uh, environments. So can you uh, so identify some growth factors which you already know? BMP. BMP, okay. So that is a bone morphogenetic protein that is a growth factor. VEGF. VEGF which is? Vascular endothelial growth factor. Vascular endothelial growth factor, do you know what is the role for that? helps in blood vessel uh, formation. Okay, angiogenesis, it is part of angiogenesis. So there are many other growth factors, we will look at some of the examples which are commonly used in tissue engineering applications. Actually growth factors can help in so many different uh, cellular responses from cell survival to proliferation to migration to differentiation and even with tissue formation. So it can actually have uh, a wide range of applications and uh, it is seen that they do not act in an endocrine fashion. It is not that the growth factors can circulate in your bloodstream and actually reach different places. That is primarily because uh, they have short half lives and uh, because of this uh, they only go through diffusion. So, but these are actually proteins, right? So these are reasonably large molecules. So they are not going to diffuse very fast. So they have very short range diffusion and this diffusion happens through the extracellular matrix which is present in the tissue and uh, they will act locally. So it will not have a large uh, like a systemic uh, effect. So this is a general uh, growth factor signaling mechanism. So this is not for any specific uh, growth factor. So what you have is a producer cell uh, which would be producing some growth factors. So all these growth factors are actually secreted by some cells. So different cells will actually produce different uh, growth factors. And these will actually then diffuse through the ECM and come in contact with the receptor on a cell surface. From there, there will be some uh, signal transduction cascade which will elicit the resp response which you are looking for. And this is a general phenomena which is commonly observed. Uh, what you need to look at carefully here is uh, what is zoomed here. So what you see is the ECM you actually can have uh, the, the molecule delivered to the site of the cell, to the cell in a spatiotemporal fashion. It is not that it all of them go and reach the cell directly. So 
some of them reach the cell at certain regions, some of them actually reach at different time points and this actually matters because this kind of a spatiotemporal release is the major was one of the major roles of ECM other than just supporting the cells to grow. So, this uh, helps in providing the proper signal for the cell to behave the way it should ok. So, that is why uh, people have seen that if you use uh, if you just implant stem cells into a tissue they usually tend to differentiate to that particular uh, cell line because there are signaling molecules and ECM microarchitectures and niches which actually help in that kind of a differentiation ok. So, ECM actually plays an active role in the signaling. So, this is one major aspect which uh, needs to be accounted for when we actually design uh, scaffolds. So, you can if you are looking to design bioactive scaffolds mimicking the ECM becomes very crucial. So, there are different factors that can govern uh, the cellular response for a growth factor. It is not that uh, you have one growth factor it will always uh, cause the same effect at the same levels it does not work that way. There are many factors which actually govern what response uh, you observe for a growth factor. So, depending on the receptor type to which the growth factor attaches itself there can actually be a different uh, response and uh, depending on the cell type again there can be a different response. Some of these things actually have some of these things actually have uh, effects on multiple cell types it is not that the growth factor can act only on one type of cells. So, when there are multiple cells which can actually act on the sorry multiple uh, cells which can be acted upon by the growth factor it depends on the cell itself because the intracellular machinery where the signaling cascade you are going to observe is going to be different for different cells. So, that means that by a cellular response can also be significantly different and uh, the ability of the um, uh, growth factor to bind to the ECM will also matter. See if a growth factor can bind to the ECM then the diffusion is going to be much slower it is going to get stuck in the ECM for a while. So, that is going to have a uh, role and ECM degradation. So, if you have something where the growth factor is uh, encapsulated in the ECM then looking at the ECM degradation will actually control the release profiles and the release pattern of the drug uh, sorry of the biomolecule and this will actually play a role and obviously concentration and uh, cell target location can also play ro major roles when it comes to what you observe for a cellular response for a growth factor ok. So, this is a bunch of growth factors that have actually been tried out for different tissue engineering applications. So, I am not sure if you can read it from there, but um, I can read it from here. So, I will read it out for you ok. So, uh, ANG1 is angiopoietin and ANG2 is also angiopoietin 2. So, these have been used for uh, treating blood vessels and heart and muscle uh, tissues. ANG1 has an effect on blood vessel matura maturation and stability whereas ANG2 can uh, destabilize, regress and dissociate endothelial cells from the surrounding tissues. And uh, FGF2 is a uh, uh, blood vessel uh, is been used in blood vessel, bone, skin, nerve, spine and muscles. So, this helps in uh, migration, proliferation and survival of endothelial cells. It also inhibits differentiation of embryonic stem cells. So, FGF has again multiple roles depending on which cell is being targeted. BMP2 and BMP7 are bone morphogenetic proteins. See many of these growth factors you would always have some associated number with it because there are many variations of these. So, uh, BMP is a class of uh, morphogenetic proteins, bone morphogenetic proteins. So, BMP2 and BMP7 have been extensively studied because they actually take part in differentiation and migration of osteoblasts. BMP7 has also been shown to have an effect on renal development. So, that is why it has been used in uh, kidney tissue engineering as well. EGF is epidermal growth factor, EPO is uh, I think erythropoietin. So, and uh, EGF has been used in skin and nerve whereas EPO has been used in nerve, spine and even wound healing because uh, so all these mo molecules actually have a significant effect on uh, different cellular responses and based on understanding what cellular response they have you can use it for the appropriate application. So, these are all the bunch of other things which you can look up. So, VEGF is another thing which is commonly studied because it helps in migration, proliferation and survival of endothelial cells. So, this means you would uh, if you need angiogenesis you can actually use uh, VEGF and hopefully get a, a vascularized tissue. So, that is something which people have been exploring for a while now. 
So, uh, using this uh, signaling molecules, people have actually taken some products to uh, higher levels. They have actually been able to take it even up to clinical studies. Okay, so, these are the clinical studies and you have uh, Viva where 178 patients have been tested with VEGF 165 and here they have just done infusions where they gave intravenous and intracoronary uh, injections to deliver this molecule and uh, this, is, was, this was done to treat cardiovascular diseases. So, however, the results were not very uh, promising, the results were actually negative uh, in I think in phase 2 probably. So, clinical trials have multiple phases. So, you have uh, phase 0 where you test it in other animals, then you have phase 1, phase 2, phase 3 and finally, phase 4 is where it is in the market and you get market feedback. Okay. So, uh, most of these things, uh, so except for the last two, BEST and OP1 putty, the other ones had actually not gotten past phase 2. So, these two have actually been commercialized, but even with OP1 putty, uh, so Ramya I actually was looking up uh, OP1 putty the today morning and looks like it is uh, been taken off the market. I am not very sure as to how it was. So, it was initially brought in by Stryker and it was purchased by Olympus and 4 years back it was dumped, uh, but I do not know if somebody is has taken it up or if it has been, because there has been a lot of controversy with respect to the side effects of it. I was just reading up a little bit on that and saw that there was controversy associated. But the other one best, that is basically uh, a product which is currently also available. Uh, it is uh, infused by Medtronic. We will talk about that product a little bit later. So, uh, they have actually tried different growth factors and what you see is the first two things are just uh, simple infusions where you just uh, deliver using some kind of an injection intravenous or uh, intracoronary and uh, they have actually failed. And people also tried uh, alginate microcapsules and that did not work either. So, collagen sponges and collagen matrices, uh, matrices have actually shown reasonable promise when it comes to delivering these molecules and it is understandable right, collagen is what your ECM is. So, uh, you are going to have a better chance of mimicking the ECM when you use that. So, as you see Early studies were focused on uh, treating ischemic diseases, that is why uh, you saw the first few things were about cardiovascular uh, diseases, right. So, you want to treat ischemic diseases using intracoronary or intravenous injections of angiogenic factors. So, it was a simple and straightforward approach, people just thought, okay, I know this molecule can trigger angiogenesis, I know this tissue is not getting blood, uh, blood supply because uh, it does not have enough blood vessels. So, you put this growth factor there, you should have new vessels formed. But it did not turn out to be as simple because the results were promising from the animal studies and phase 1 trials, but uh, phase 2 trials did not show expected results. Why do you think it failed? What could be the potential reasons? Think of all possible reasons from a clinical trial standpoint as to why something can fail and then go into specifics of why this probably failed. Okay, side effects. So, why do you think side effects would come? Because it is not targeted enough. Okay, it is not targeted enough. Okay. Okay, you have a question. What is the difference between phase 1 and phase 2 trials? Okay, so uh, phase 1 you are supposed to give subtherapeutic levels of uh, subtherapeutic dosage and it is given for a smaller number of uh, patients. Uh, patients. And in phase 2, you are supposed to deliver therapeutic levels to a larger patient sample size. Therapeutic, uh, what is the difference between both of them? Therapeutic okay, and okay. <laughs> uh, so for any drug, you actually have uh, something called a therapeutic uh, index, right? So you have to have a minimum uh, effective concentration and a maximum toxic uh, concentration. So, if the drug is a drug or any molecule is at a concentration higher than the toxicity levels, it is going to have serious side effects. If it is less than the minimum effective concentration, you are not going to have any effect. So, within this window is called the therapeutic concentration. So, initially you give something which is subtherapeutic, which is lower than the therapeutic concentrations because you want to know that, see you would have studied and identified that uh, this level, this concentration, this dosage will have the desired effect. But you do not know if that dosage will cause uh, negative effects. Okay. So, what you do is you start with a very low effect, uh, think, knowing that it will not do any good, but you still want to know if there is any harm which is being done. Okay. So, that is phase 1. 
in phase 2 what you do is you do both you do some uh, you basically group them into uh, group patients into control groups and other groups and you put them as one group with subtherapeutic and one group with therapeutic levels so if the subtherapeutic levels don't show any uh, negative effects then you go to phase 2 then you compare subtherapeutic with therapeutic effects uh, as a phase 2 trial and then phase 3 you do all therapeutic levels for a much larger sample size and the sample sizes will depend on what type of uh, drug we are dealing with and uh, whether there is looking at you are looking at specificity for example if you are looking for a cancer drug then uh, you might want uh, groups for different types of cancers and see how that drug would have an effect on different cancers you might say that it works for oral cancer but it does not work for uh, some uh, colon cancer right so there could always be differences so those kinds of things you need to uh, look at so that's what the clinical trials are so what do you think could be the potential reasons side effects is uh, the serious cause but what do you think causes the side effect immune response like immune the immune system there is slight variation from person to person Okay, so uh, yeah, so it, that is a more of a personalized medicine which you are talking about. So you would not have, uh, if you are using one general thing, there can always be a problem. But here, uh, chances of an immune rejection would be much lesser because you are only looking at uh, a protein which is already present in your body, and you are just supplying it as an intravenous injection or an intracoronary injection. Then maybe the drug delivery aspect of it. Okay, how you deliver it, the mode of delivery could be a problem. So. The other, yeah. Because in vaccination, like uh, I read that it is better to inject the vaccination in the muscle rather than directly in the bloodstream because muscle or the skin surface is more. So what he's talking about is just mode of delivery is completely different. The whole idea is different for a vaccination. Yeah. So uh, see, mode of delivery can have a role to play here. Um, but not really about how it is intravenous or uh, intramuscular or intracoronary whatever. So, it, it could have an effect with respect to uh, what uh, like whether it reaches the site or not. When it comes to vaccine, it is a different mechanism. Here, you are looking for it to reach the site. If I give an injection, intravenous injection, it is probably not going to reach the ischemic tissue which is probably close to my heart. Right, so uh, intracoronary would probably be better because it de delivers it re directly to the site. So that mode of uh, thing, uh, mode of delivery could have a role, but not exactly the way you say, but in a different uh, approach. Um, because it worked in animal studies and it didn't work with people, basically. It, I mean, you mentioned some factors which determine the response, something like ECM, whether it's encapsulated in the ECM mm -hmm. and the affinity to the ECM and the cell type and the receptors. So it might be something to do with that. Yeah. So, uh, it also depends on uh, like what actually how it is delivered not just the mode of delivery we are looking at uh, whether it is encapsulated in a molecule because you are uh, you need to have how it interacts with the uh, with the organism right. So, it, uh, it would differently it, it would interact differently in a uh, smaller species like a rat or a rabbit. And when you take it to larger animals or humans, it is going to have a slightly different effect. It quite possibly can have uh, different effects. So, usually not more than uh, one third of the animal studies are actually reproducible in humans. So, there can always be some uh, issues with that. Okay. Anything else? So, when we say animal studies, do we even consider monkeys in that? So, uh, anim anim monkeys are animals, so we would consider. <laughs> Uh, see, not really. Uh, see, no. Uh, technically speaking, apes are the closest to humans. Monkeys are not. And uh, even amongst apes, it's actually quite difficult to uh, do very large-scale studies with uh, these kinds of apes. So, if I, w I would want to perform uh, studies with maybe a uh, hundred chimpanzees, it's not really going to happen. So, there are other statistical issues associated with uh, how the data is interpreted and uh, you cannot completely uh, take this forward. In some cases, it will actually be easy to uh, extrapolate. It depends on how the complexity of the tissue itself and it also depends on uh, how that particular organ functions compared to a human organ. So, for example, if you were to take pancreas, 
a pig's pancreas is closer to a human pancreas than an ape's pancreas because the insulin response, the sugar response and insulin release are quite similar. So it just depends on all that. So there is a, you cannot just say doing it in ape will be the best thing. So for that particular tissue, what would be the best thing? And again for thrombotic effects, if you can work with uh, lambs or uh, uh, pigs, they would have a much more aggressive uh, thrombus formation compared to what you would see in humans. So then you are now going to have a very different uh, set of results. So there is always going to be uh, variations which you have to account for. Okay. So, okay. so what I had here was uh, basically some of the things which you already said. Side effect uh, is primarily because of the dose used. Okay. So uh, when you use subtherapeutic levels, you are basically using very low concentrations. Very low concentrations of, uh, see if you take low enough of a concentration of anything, it is not going to cause any effects. You, even if cyanide could not kill you if you take it in a low enough concentration, right. So uh, when it is in a subtherapeutic level, it is not going to cause any effect and that is okay. But once you take it to therapeutic levels, that is when you are actually doing it in a uh, at a level which actually has any meaning. And if that causes problems, it basically throws away your uh, molecule and route of admi administration or mode of administration. So I call it route of administration and mode of delivery I am basically talking about uh, whether it is encapsulated or like you know, whether it is in solution and so on. So we al I already said that uh, ECM plays a role in, in uh, presenting the growth factor to the cell. It is not just about the growth factor reaching the cell, right. The ECM may, has a way to present it in a spatiotemporal fashion that actually controls the precise way the cellular responses happen. So there are factors and obviously there can always be inappropriate clinical trial designs, so which could also lead to such uh, results which do not really give you conclusive uh, proofs. So uh, basically what was done in the early studies was large doses of potent growth factors which were formulated in the solution uh, were directly injected into the body. The bad thing about this is this can lead to severe side effects because you have to give a very large quantity of the molecule for it to have any therapeutic effect because I already said uh, they have very short half lives, right? so they can actually degre degrade very quickly and they will also get uh, and if you are going to give it in an intravenous injection, it is not going to reach the site of action for a long time. So it will not survive for that. So for it to, for you to make sure that at least the therapeutic level reaches the site of action, you have to load a lot of the growth factors into the body, which will be a very bad thing to do. So and again uh, the other side of it is uh, when you deliver using intravenous thing, even if you load very high concentrations, it is still not going to reach the target tissue in the necessary time frame within which it degrades, right. So then what happens is you are only observing side effects and uh, your de desired effects are not even seen. These are serious problems when you try to give an intravenous injection or an, uh, just supply it as a solution. So uh, one example would be VEGF. VEGF has a physiological half-life of about 30 minutes when infused <coughs> intravenously. See as I already said all these things uh, do not, none of these growth factors operate in an endocrine mechanism, right. So they do not actually flow through the bloodstream. So when you put it in an intravenous thing, they are actually going to degrade very fast and uh, 30 minutes is probably a very short time for VEGF to reach the site of action and what would happen is uh, to ensure something at least reaches the site of action, you are going to have uh, a huge concent uh, concentration of VEGF loaded to the, uh, with the injection and when you do that, you are going to have pathological blood vessel formation like what you would see in cancer, right. In cancer, VEGF is actually overexpressed. So there are therapies, cancer drugs, which basically just block VEGF. So when you have very high concentrations of VEGF, you are going to have some kind of a dormant tumor which is going to be formed and that is not really something you want to do, okay. So there are, uh, people need to have, uh, have better understanding of the how to deliver it. That was the major. Uh, lacuna which had to be addressed eventually and uh, so what people did was to put it in some kind of a matrix and then deliver it. So one thing which was reasonably successful is uh, the commercial product Infuse. So this was, uh, this is being marketed by Medtronic. 
So, this is used in uh, anterior lumbar interbody fusion surgery. So, basically spinal fusion surgeries and uh, here what they use is a recombinant human uh, bone morphogenetic protein. So, this is just produced uh, using fundamental molecular biology techniques. Uh, BMP is uh, overexpressed in an organism and produced as a recombinant uh, protein. So, these uh, bone morphogenetic proteins ha have the ability to initiate bone growth. So, because of this the material infuse is highly osteoinductive and this helps in uh, regeneration of the bone tissues. So, this is used along with a cage uh, and an absorbable uh, cotton uh, collagen sponge carrier. So, uh, it, they call it ACS carriers. Okay. So, uh, this can potentially eliminate the need for autogenous uh, bone graft and that is what they claim to do, claim to make. But again there are still limitations about uh, the size of it and how you can replace it. Like for in some cases it can actually be a substitute for autogenous uh, bone grafts. So, this is how it works. So, what you have is uh, the first step is uh, implantation. So, you basically implant this uh, combination of BMP2 with uh, the collagen sponge and then you would see chemotaxis where there is migration of mesenchymal stem cells and other bone forming cells to the site of uh, implantation. So, because you have the bone morphogenetic protein there is going to be signals sent to the nearby bone cells and bone forming cells to come to this site. Right? So, they start migrating towards it and uh, then there will be differentiation sorry then there will be proliferation where uh, this particular material provides the environment where stem cells can multiply before differentiation because you have a collagen matrix on which they can attach and uh, start multiplying. And uh, the differentiation happens because you have the BMP2 it binds to the receptors on the stem cell surface and then this helps in the differentiation of stem cells into osteoblasts. And then you have bone formation and angiogenesis. So, the osteoblasts will respond to the local mechanical forces to produce a new mineralized tissue which replaces the collagen matrix which they had used. And new blood vessel formation is also observed at the same time. So, this is uh, this is not truly triggered by uh, this molecule itself, but there have been studies which say that BMP and VEGF can actually have an in, uh, have a dialogue basically. So, they can actually interact and uh, create vascularization. So, there are some studies which suggest that and uh, there is. Uh, so, finally, you have remodeling where the body continues to remodel the bone uh, in response to the environment and the mechanical forces. So, this will finally form the trabecular bone. So, this is the mechanism of action. So, this is directly from their website and uh, this is what they claim to have been the mechanism of action for infuse. So, the important uh, thing which we need to look at is the importance of the carrier. So, whenever we are looking at signaling molecule delivery again the material we use uh, as a carrier comes into play. So, that is why biomaterial is actually a very crucial component when it comes to tissue engineering. It depends on it is not just about providing a scaffold and support it is also about delivering the molecules and uh, presenting the molecules in the right way. So, the protein should actually be retained at the site of implantation for a certain period of time only then it can have an effect. If it is going to get diffused away right a very in a very short time you are not going to have enough time for the cells to migrate to the towards the site or to differentiate or proliferate and do whatever. So, uh, people have shown that retention and bone regeneration uh, have a positive correlation. So, if you can retain this molecule for a longer period of time you are going to have better bone regeneration. Okay. So, those are so that is why people try to look at controlled release of these molecules. Okay. So, people want it to come out in a very slow and sustained fashion. Okay. So, there are many other signals as well uh, which I will not go into great detail which can actually be used for uh, stimulating cellular responses. Mechanical stimulation has been explored uh, extensively recently and there are other things like electrical, optical, magnetic and ultrasound signals as well which can be used for stimulating cells either in vitro or in some cases even in vivo. Okay. So, mechanical uh, stimulation is basically deformation which is transduced 
by a biophysical mechanism to create a biochemical response and uh, this will result in either the cell migration or gene expression and so on. So, people have shown that uh, the mechanical property of a material can uh, such as elasticity or, uh, the, or the strength of the material and all those things can actually affect how the stem cell differentiates, cells which are cultured on these can differentiate even without the presence of other growth factors. So, uh, these are also factors which need to be considered while you are taking, uh, while you are developing any tissue engineered product. So, if you are going to uh, develop a reactor, you would want to uh, provide these kinds of signals as well. So, the idea is uh, reactors for tissue engineering are slightly different from the reactors you would have studied as part of your bioprocess uh, training. So, these reactors are here uh, to provide signals as well as maintaining the controlled environment. In case of uh, a bioprocess, you want a controlled environment and maybe do large scale production, but here this can also provide signals and usually it is the reactors are designed in a way that you can deliver desired signals, either it could be mechanical or electrical or whether it is perfusion and so on. So, there are so many factors which would be looked at. So, we will talk about how reactors can be designed in later in the semester. Okay. So, now that we have looked at the basic introduction, so this is the summary of uh, the issues in uh, tissue engineering. When we talk about uh, tissue engineering, the first question we need to have an answer to is do we want an in vitro tissue, tissue to be engineered or an in vivo tissue regeneration, right. So, the two, there are two terms tissue engineering and regenerative medicine, right. So, these are used interchangeably, but technically speaking they are slightly different. So, uh, tissue engineering is engineering a tissue in vitro and then implanting it in uh, a human body, whereas uh, regenerative medicine is providing the support environment which can actually help in regeneration of the tissue in vivo. So, that is actually the difference between the two. However, it is very commonly uh, used in an interchangeable fashion. There are uh, journals and associations which are just called tissue engineering and regenerative medicine because they kind of come together when it is uh, discussed for research. Okay. So, once we know what we want to do there, then we need to identify how we take the three questions, the three arms of the triad like what scaffold to use, what cells to use and what signals do you want to deliver. So, what scaffolds? So, it is not just about what material you use, it is also about how you fabricate it, what should be the pore characteristics, what should be the surface characteristics, what should be the physical and mechanical properties, the chemical properties of it. So, whether it is biodegradable or if it should be degradable, then at what rate should it be degradable? Because depending on the tissue, you are going to have different rates of the tissue regeneration itself. A bone tissue can take maybe up to 16 to 18 weeks for it to regenerate. So, I would not want my uh, scaffold to degrade in 2 weeks, whereas uh, a skin or a wound re uh, replacement might actually regenerate in 2 to 4 weeks. So, I would not want the material to be remaining for 6 months, right. So, depending on how you I want to tailor the degradation, I would have to look at how I would cross link it, what type of materials I can use. There could be something like PCL which has a very slow degradation. You can use something like PEG which actually just gets dissolved in a much faster way. So, depending on all these things you can actually tailor the material to provide these desired properties. And you can also uh, functionalize these materials to get desired surface properties like hydrophilicity, hydrophobicity and uh, electrical properties and so on. All these things you can do with respect to the material. So, that uh, you need to decide based on the tissue and based on what you can actually accomplish, right. So, if you need a micro architecture, see, see in cases you should not try to over engineer stuff in the sense that uh, if you are trying to design something which is a very simple tissue, do not go for the most high end technology just because it is re uh, readily available and accessible. So, use something which would make scientific sense look at what would be the best thing to do for this particular uh, application and try to use that. And then the next thing is to identify cells. So, you here you could use primary cells of uh, which are differentiated or stem cells and uh, how to retain or attain phenotypes because if you are using stem cells then you need to differentiate them to get the desired phenotype. If you are looking at uh, differentiated cells, 
then you need to make sure they maintain their phenotypes because once you put them in a, in a different environment, they might actually re-differentiate. They might de-differentiate or re-differentiate, they can actually become something else. So, there are always problems associated with those things as well. And uh, the cells, it is not just that they maintain the phenotype, they should finally deliver with the functions as well, right. So, it is just, it's not just about maintain, expressing the receptors and so on. It needs to make sure, you need to make sure that it can do the function at the final stage. Final aspect is to identify the signals. As we discussed, there are like so many different uh, molecules which you can work with, but uh, you need to identify which cellular response you are targeting. So, whether you want bone regeneration or uh, blood vessel formation or uh, cell migration. So, depending on that, you first identify the molecules you want to work, work with and then how you deliver these molecules whether you directly load them to some uh, material using physical cross-linking or do you chemically cross-link so that there is uh, molecules, the cells can migrate towards it. If you are going to chemically cross-link, will the signal still provide, the molecules still provide the same signals because it may not leach out. So, there are and uh, the covalent bonds should not affect the molecule itself. So, there are so many factors which you have to account for when you do that. And uh, last aspect is the spatiotemporal release. So, this is a major challenge. So, uh, your ECM actually tells the cells the way how they should behave, right. It is through different molecules. It is uh, see everybody knows VEGF does this, but in your body VEGF is controlled in a way that it creates healthy vessels. So, first VEGF acts and then uh, PDGF acts and then you have other growth factors like angiopoietin acting to make sure that you get healthy uh, blood vessels which are not leaky. Whereas, when we engineer these, uh, uh, these tissues, we cannot actually control, uh, we cannot load three different growth factors and control when which one gets released and then store the rest of it, right. So, if I start releasing VEGF, even if I load three different growth factors, all of them are going to come out at the same time. So, how do I then control which comes out at the uh, at first and then followed by the other one and what is the trigger for the next thing to follow, right. How do I know there has been enough effect of VEGF and now it is time for PDGF to act and once I know that it even if I know that this is enough effect of VEGF, how do I stop VEGF from releasing. So, these are serious questions and uh, people try to address it, there are different things which people try to do. Uh, we will look, look at those things, I will actually share papers which you guys will end up presenting, okay. So, you read up and present. So, current status uh, of the field of tissue engineering is clearly define the specific clinical problem to be solved, implement, try to implement the simplest procedure to treat the problem to achieve meaningful clinical benefit. Do not go for the most uh, advanced technology for something too trivial, it is just not uh, the sensible thing to do, okay. So, because you need to look at cost, ben, uh, cost and benefit risk ratio, you need to make sure that uh, the procedure you do should not have too much of an adverse effect and uh, any tissue that does not have the capability for spontaneous regeneration has still not been engineered successfully. So, that is one major challenge which we need to address and the experience has taught us that full regeneration may not be necessary to achieve meaningful, meaningful clinical results. So, there could just be things like uh, some aspects which would provide satisfactory results, right, which is what you, you start with. Right? Uh, most of the implants are not the best case scenario, but you still uh, use them because you know that gives you enough of a result for meaningful clinical uh, improvements. So, because this is the case, you need to identify how close to uh, good is good enough, how, how much regeneration is required. So, you would have to address that at, as you work on the field, okay. So, this is what the state of tissue engineering overall can be given as and we need to focus on different applications to see where exactly we stand, how exactly it can actually be uh, taken forward, okay. Thank you guys. Thank you.